I'm a belt and suspenders type of guy. And a few days ago, I was preaching to an assembly that will remain nameless in another country. And 10 minutes into my message, we totally lost our Zoom feed. So I always record myself audio as a backup. So even if the Zoom doesn't work out for the video record, I do have an audio backup that I'll share with Luke and he can share with all of you if you want it. As he mentioned, I've been recording a lot on YouTube and putting that up on my channel for anyone to see, doing a weekday series on Mark and also ongoing series on Romans, 1 Peter, uh, 1 Samuel, and other parts of the Word of God as well. So my wife is emailing that link to Luke and he'll share it with you all. And so you can hopefully benefit from that when you need some encouragement from God's word. Today, I want to look with you at Psalm 90, Psalm number 90. And it's good to see you all, if not be with you all. Wish we could be together physically, but this is the next best thing under the circumstances. Psalm 90, which I believe is the only one that is attributed to Moses in the title. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And we're going to eventually work our way through the whole psalm, but we're just going to start reading the first six verses. Psalm 90, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it cuts down and it withers. It is cut down, rather and withers. Now, that's an opening that might be kind of daunting. You say it even sounds rather depressing. And I think the circumstances we find ourselves in uh, around the world today aren't uncommon to many of the experiences of the saints in the Bible, particularly when one thinks about Moses, how that this man spent two-thirds of his life in the desert. He spent, you remember, the second part of his life in the backside of the desert of Midian for special training from the Lord. And then, of course, the third part of his life, when he led Israel out of the uh, nation of Egypt, out of their bondage there, he led them through the wilderness for that third 40-year period of his life. And so Moses knew what it was like to be in barren environs, to have trouble around him. And when you think of how he had to go with that generation that disbelieved the word of the Lord, that at Kadesh Barnea was on the very border of going into the land that God had promised to give them. And they said, no, we don't think the Lord can really deliver on his promise. And of course, the gospel is a two-sided coin, that God provides redemption from the penalty and the power of sin but he also is providing redemption from the presence of sin. In other words, we're saved from the judgment that our sins deserve when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he saves us from the power of sin, that his spirit comes to work within us and to conform us to the image of his son and give us the power to overcome and to live differently for the Lord, to live for his glory. And we have that blessed hope, that certainty today, that if we know the Lord Jesus, he that shall come will come and will tarry not. That as he said, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so the Lord Jesus is coming for us, and it's what Romans 8 calls the redemption of the body. He's going to pick up what he's redeemed, pick up what he purchased at the cross of Calvary, pick up his people, even us. And he's going to transform these mortal bodies into immortal bodies. This corruptible shall put on incorruptibility. So says 1 Corinthians 15. 
Now, when you think about that, the generation there that came out of Egypt, except for a small remnant, the majority of them said, yes, we believe God can save us from the penalty of our sins. He can save us from the death that was falling on Egypt, the death of the firstborn. And they took the blood of that lamb and put it outside their houses. And they said, yes, we believe he can save us from the power of Egypt. He opened up the Red Sea and we went forth on dry ground. And our enemies trying to do that were drowned. But when they got to the promised land, they didn't believe the last part. They didn't believe that God could actually deliver them into the inheritance that he had promised them. They didn't believe that the new life that God promised them was something he could deliver on. And yet the Lord can do that. The Lord's not interested in merely saving our souls from hell. Thankfully, that's part of the gospel. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But he wants to make us a holy people like his son. And he wants us to be in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem with him to rule and reign forever and forever. And this is the Lord's work. He's committed to that. So when you think of Moses being among that remnant, that did not disbelieve God, that did not reject the word of the Lord, that believed the Lord, and yet had to wander in the wilderness like his contemporaries Joshua and Caleb also had to. You think about what would sustain Moses as he saw uh, what the hymn writer might call change and decay in all around I see. What would keep Moses going? And I believe this psalm gives us the secret. In fact, Mr. Tiernus Wilson used to link this psalm with Psalm 91. Psalm 91 begins rather famously saying, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And you remember that is from where uh, Elizabeth Elliot took the title of the biography of her husband, Jim Elliot, one of those Ecuador martyrs who was mentioned earlier. And it's that fact that wandering in the wilderness, we can have the Lord for our dwelling place. We can dwell in the secret place of the Most High. In other words, we can have close communion with the Lord. That's what gets us through the barren times. That's what carries us through crisis. Now, when we think about Psalm 90, it breaks down into three sections. The three sections of Psalm 90 are verses 1 through 6, the imperishable and eternal God the imperishable and eternal God. That's Psalm 90, verses 1 through 6. Verses 7 through 12 talks about perishable, mortal humanity. Perishable, mortal humanity. That's 7 through 12. And then the third section, 13 through 17, talks about the imperishability of the plan of God for his people. The imperishability of the plan of God for his people. So the Europeans always complain about we Americans that our movies <laughs> demand a happy ending. And they, they say, oh, that's not how life is. We make movies that are more realistic with sad endings. Well, okay, but nobody really wants to see those movies. So there you are. Uh, but anyway, Psalm 90 has a happy ending, you see. And the ending can be happy. And the story itself is happy throughout when we get our eyes off of our circumstances and on to the Lord, when we look away from the desert and even from the death that is all around us and we fix our gaze on the Lord in glory, that's what's going to carry us through. So let's work our way through Psalm 90 that the Lord may encourage us. Now, verse one, he starts out, Lord. So this is a God-focused psalm. It is theocentric. So often we start out with ourselves and we say, how am I going to get through this? But Moses had the right attitude. He said, Lord. Now here the word Lord is not that frequent name of the Lord in the Old Testament that is spelled in all capital letters in the King James and the New King James Bibles and other translations as well. That would be the name Yahweh or Jehovah it used to be transliterated. And that is the name of the covenant-keeping God. That is the great I am that I am. This is a different title of the Lord that is often used in Scripture. It's also very common. It's the word Adon, okay? And you often hear it, Adonai, our Lord. 
So if you know Michael Card's song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Er Kamkona Adonai, that is this word without the plural ending. It's the word Adon. It's the idea of a Lord in a master-servant relationship. So Moses, for all of his royal upbringing, for all of his being learned in all the wisdom of Egypt, as uh, Stephen describes him in Acts chapter 7, for all of the riches and opulence that he was surrounded with in his early life, Moses was one who took the shoes off his feet in the presence of deity. In other words, he was one who reverenced the Lord and who looked at the Lord as his Lord, his master. Now, I don't know if we consciously think about this. I, I try to every week when we come together to remember the Lord Jesus, we remember how often 1 Corinthians 11 repeatedly speaks about the Lord. And Paul tells the Corinthians, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating, I'm paraphrasing, but it's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper the way you all are carrying on. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were treating it like their supper. But one thing the Lord's Supper teaches us is that he is the Lord and we are his suppliants. We are his subservient people. We are those who bow in his presence and we own the greatness of our God. And we say, Lord, you are our Lord. We say, not unto us, not unto us, but to thy name give glory. That is the aspiration of a Christian's heart. And we remember that God is our Lord, that he's in charge. And how good to say, like Moses says here, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. So Moses looks back beyond his circumstance. He does the same thing we're doing this morning just as we're looking back through the eons of time to how God worked on behalf of his people in the Old Testament, God uh, here is said to be our dwelling place in all generations. So Moses could think back to how his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, how they dwelt in tents, and yet the Lord was their dwelling place. They had no settled abiding place in one sense, no territory that they could say, this is our own, we can live in it and we don't have to move. No, the symbols of Abraham's life were the tent and the altar, the tent because he was a pilgrim. And Hebrews 11 reminds us that a pilgrim is someone who seeks a better country. Someone who says, as Peter says of us in 1 Peter 2, that we're pilgrims and strangers, we're strangers. We don't belong here. We're resident aliens, if you will. Uh, not the UFO type, the kind that come from another foreign country, you know, those kind. I'm not bringing little green men into my message today, unless my son puts uh, one of his little Yoda figurines in the camera. But that's another matter. In any case, we don't fit here. We don't belong here. Paul said, but God forbid that I should boast save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The world looks at us and they say, these people are weird. We don't get them. They don't fit here. And we say, yes, and the world has nothing for me. <laughs> uh, Mr. Darby wrote a hymn. He said, the world is a wilderness wide. I have nothing to seek or to choose. You know, this world isn't the place of our contentment. It isn't the place that satisfies us. We walk through this world with the Lord, and it's the Lord who contents us. That's why 1 Timothy 6 tells us godliness with contentment is great gain. We need to seek our satisfaction in the Lord. And ultimately, we're going to be received up into the Lord's presence to enjoy the Lord forever. Paul famously said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die gain. Uh, a former missionary who's now in glory, Brother Frank Haggerty, who served many years in Bolivia, he used to paraphrase that verse this way. He'd say, for me to live is Christ and to die is more of the same. It makes us think of another psalm, Psalm 37. Delight thyself in the Lord and he will give thee the desires of thy heart. What is it you think when you read a verse like that? Do you think, oh, if I delight myself in the Lord, the Lord will give me that Lamborghini I've always wanted or that Ferrari. No, if you delight yourself in the Lord, guess what? 
He's going to give you more of himself. He's going to give you the enjoyment of who he is. And this is how Moses lived. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Now, in Hebrew thought, you can go through your concordance and look up the mountains, and they're considered the very oldest parts of the earth. And even the modern geologists would sort of speak of mountains that way. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, the world there being the word for the habitable earth where people live. Before he made any of these things, he says at the end of verse two, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Or I like how Mr. Darby and others translate it, from eternity to eternity, you are God. If your mind stretches back to eternity past, before there was ever anything, then there was God. And if your mind stretches forward to when this earth will pass away in its current form, there still is God, unwavering, unchanging. The God who says, I am the Lord, I change not. Now he's someone, therefore, we can put our trust in, we can have our faith in, we can confide in and know he's going to be there come what may. He says, you turn man to destruction in verse three and say, return, O children of men. And, and the idea of turning man to destruction, uh, one of the words used here could be rendered, you turn man to dust. And it's reminiscent of what God said in Genesis 3.19, dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. So when we think of mankind in their fallen state, when we think of how sin came into the world and death through sin. Our mortality means that the Lord has the right to take our life away, that the wages of sin is death, that it is appointed once for a man to die. But after this, the judgment, we know these verses, the soul that sinneth that shall die and so forth. He says, you turn man to destruction or to dust and you say, return, O children of men. Now there's two different ideas there. It could be, he's saying, you're the one who says to a living human being, it's time to go back where you came from. I, can, I gave you life. I can take your life. You came from dust. You can return to dust. That's probably the thought here. But some would suggest that he's the one who says, return, O children of men. And he's the one who, even when we die, if that would be our lot, that the Lord can say, return, he can raise us back up to life. And of course, we have ample evidence from the scripture of the power of our Lord Jesus to restore life to the dead. But what's coming in the future is going to be so much better than any of the resuscitations that he did in his gospel ministry. When he walked on the earth, it's true. He raised Jairus's daughter. He raised the widow of Nain's son. He raised his friend Lazarus of Bethany. But those people all died again. I tell you, the Lord when he comes back again, it's going to do something far more wonderful. He is the one who is the first fruits of them that sleep. So says 1 Corinthians 15, 20. In other words, he's going to bring a great harvest of redeemed people, glorified men and women raised from the dead. Think of it. What a wonderful thing it'll be. How the Lord Jesus spoke about the future kingdom and said that many will come from east and west and north and south and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You remember what our Lord said to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, that he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Our God is the God of resurrection. The Lord Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. So whether this phrase is saying that or not, I don't think so in context. We know the truth of it, though, is true in many other scriptures of the Bible. And we'll see the glorious future that the Lord has for us in the third section of the psalm. Now look at verse 4. He says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They're like a sleep in the morning. They're like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it cuts down and withers. Now those are quite graphic descriptions of the passing of time and how what seems so long to us to the Lord is really brief. That the Lord being eternal is one who doesn't reckon time the way we do. Second Peter 3 says that a thousand years to the Lord is like a day and a day like a thousand years. 
So our Lord doesn't think by the same time constraints and space constraints that we think of. And when we think of the glory of mankind, when we think about the impressive things that we've done and the empires that have risen on the earth, we can say about all those empires, they all eventually fall. And though some of them have lasted for hundreds of years, some of them for over a thousand years in the case of Rome, yet eventually they fall. And yet the Lord remains unchanged. He's carrying on time like this flood, like this sleep. And all of these times they flourish and they grow and then they wither and die. And we can think of how he speaks about humanity in similar terms in Psalm 103 and in Isaiah 40. He says, the glory of man is like the grass and his, his beauty is like the flower of the grass. And the grass, which is so verdant and lovely, when that hot wind and that sun comes up and dries it, it desiccates, it becomes dried and withered, and it falls away and is put into the oven. And even First Peter chapter 1 contrasts that with the word of the Lord, saying the word of the Lord abides forever. And it's by that imperishable seed, the word of the Lord, that we have our eternal life. So our hope isn't down here. It's not looking at the world around us. If we're honest, we say like Moses, this world is a wilderness. It's like living in the desert. And all around us, there's death, whether it's COVID-19 or cancer or heart disease or diabetes or any number of things that can usher a person into eternity. They're not all disease and, and pestilence, are they? There can be car wrecks. There can be wars. There can be crime. Eventually, all of us will die if the Lord doesn't come first. And yet the wonderful thing is this God we have has a plan to supersede death, the one who has already achieved the victory over it. Now let's look briefly at the second section because uh, we want to camp out on the third a little longer. Verse 7, for we have been consumed by your anger. This is the impermanence of fallen humanity, of mortal man. We've been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Now, that's a scary thing when you think about the God whose eyes are everywhere. When you think of how Hebrew says all things are naked and open with him with whom we have to do. When you think about the Lord being the light and you say, how could I possibly come to the light? Being someone laden with sin, being someone who falls short of the glory of God. And the Lord, of course, gives us the answer. He tells us in the New Covenant, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. First John 1, 7 says, we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, this is how we can come to the light. And we might think like Moses, Lord, you're disciplining us. Lord, you're chastising us. And sometimes the Lord does that. Hebrews 12, quoting the Proverbs, says that the Lord chastens those whom he loves. He scourges every son whom he receives. If you're not disciplined by the Lord, if he doesn't correct you when you go astray, then you're not a son, you're an illegitimate child. But the Lord loves us too much for that. He corrects us. He's training us. He's teaching us. He's conforming us to the image of his son. And yet the reality is that no chastisement for the time seems pleasurable. It's grievous, Hebrews 12 says. So it's not a fun process. And that's why it's good to keep short accounts with the Lord. It's good to stay close to the Lord. It's good to come to him every day. And when we sin, to rush into his presence because we know 1 John 1, 9 says, if we can our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrest. How good is our Lord, who having washed us all over when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, continues every day of our Christian life to wash our feet. And we go to him and say, Lord, I've stepped into defilement in this world. I've, I've thought something I shouldn't, said something I shouldn't, seen something I shouldn't, whatever it may be. You take it to the Lord and the Lord is able to deal with that. He says, all our days, verse 9, have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. Now, Moses himself finished his years at 120. And Deuteronomy tells us in his obituary that his strength had not abated 
his eyesight wasn't failing. He still was a vigorous man. So it wasn't like Moses just petered out at the end. The fact that he only saw the promised land and couldn't enter into it was because of one unfortunate moment of disobedience. And yet, by grace, he would eventually stand in that promised land. You remember he was on the Mount of Transfiguration in glory with our Lord and with Elijah. That he and Elijah spoke with our Lord concerning the exodus that he was going to make at Jerusalem. And yet the experience of most of the people around Moses and most of humanity is our life does wind down and we kind of peter out. We might have been strong once physically or mentally. And so often our lives pass away like a sigh. Uh, what is your life, even a vapor, which appeareth for a little time, says James. He says the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they're 80 Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So in other words, a reverence to God is not misplaced. We ought to reverence the one who gives life and who has power to take life. We ought to reverence this one. As the Lord said, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who, when he has killed the body, can cast body and soul into hell. You see, the Lord is the ultimate one we need to reverence and bow to. And so he takes a lesson from this. He ends this second section in verse 12 saying, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's kind of the Old Testament equivalent of the phrase in Ephesians and Colossians, redeeming the time. Lord, remind us that we don't have forever, that the days fly swiftly by, that the years and the decades go by, even centuries go by so quickly. Lord, teach us to use every day for your glory. Teach us to stay close to you and prepare for eternity. And then in the final section in verse 13, he calls out, return, O Lord. And the wonderful thing about God is he says in Zechariah 1, turn unto me and I will turn unto you. You know that that's how the Lord is. He says, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh to you. Whenever we repent, the Lord is there for us. Whenever we turn around again to him, whenever we cry out to him, he comes. He says, how long, how long are we going to have to go through things like the wilderness? How long, we might say today, are we going to have to endure this COVID-19 pandemic? Have compassion on your servants. Well, that is something that God is rich in, mercy. God loves to have compassion on his people. God is near to us, never more so than in trouble and trial. He says in verse 14, oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. If we look around at our circumstance, if we look at what's around us, we'd be depressed. If we look within us at ourselves, again, we would be downcast. We would say, Lord, I'm weak and I'm passing away. But we look to the Lord and we say, Lord, you can satisfy us with mercy that we may be re rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad, verse 15 says, according to the days in which you've afflicted us, the years in which we've seen evil. So Moses said, you know, the chastisement and the training that has an end. And now, Lord, I know you've got better things ahead for us. I know you want to lavish on us your bounty, your blessings, and let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. It's funny because the generation of unbelievers, that generation that came out of Egypt, but balked at the border that wouldn't go into the promised land, that at Kadesh Barnea, they gave the excuse. They said, Lord, we can't go in there. There are giants. And it's not that we're cowardly. It's our children, you see. They're going to kill our children. And God said, oh, it's your children, eh? Well, the very children you're worried about, I'm going to take into the promised land. It's you who don't believe who aren't going to see it. And you know, God loves our children more than we ever could. To put our children into the Lord's hands is the safest place where they could be. I think about that godly woman, Hannah, who took her son, Samuel, 
whom she had prayed for and received from the Lord. She named him Samuel, heard of the Lord. This was an answer to prayer. And she took him up to the house of the Lord. But who was there? It was Eli. And he hadn't done a good job with his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, utter failures from a spiritual point of view. Yet her faith wasn't in Eli or in the priesthood or anything like that. Her faith was in the Lord. And she committed her son to the Lord. She said, I've lent him, not to Eli, not to the tribe of Levi. I've lent him to the Lord, and he shall be the Lord's. And so Samuel grew up from his youngest days serving the Lord until he was an old man. Such was his faithfulness. Read his wonderful valedictory in 1 Samuel chapter 12. In any case, let our children see your glory and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You know, the Lord Jesus talked about building, didn't he? Talked about a man who built on the sand and he saw everything pass away. And he said, there's another way to build though. You can build on the rock and the rock withstands the floods. The rock withstands the winds and the rains. It stands, doesn't it? You remember in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about the different materials that we can build the church on. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. But we can build on that foundation. How are we going to build on it? Well, you can build with gold, silver, and precious stones. You can build with beautiful things that will adorn God's house. Or you can build with wood, hay, and stubble. Things that are combustible things that are going, not going to survive the fire of God's evaluating judgment, things that will burn up. What a horrible thing to be saved so as by fire, to come to the presence of the Lord and find, yes, you had eternal life, but your life didn't count very much for God. It was mostly wasted. May God help us to have the same attitude that Moses had. Lord, establish our work. Let us be working for you. Whatever you call us to do, it may be giving a cup of cold water in your name. It may be something that humanly speaking seems very small, but Lord, I give it unto you. You remember those small things given to the Lord Jesus, five loaves and two fishes, but how he multiplied it. And if we give our little lives to the Lord, how he can multiply them. Now Moses prayed for the beauty of the Lord our God to be upon us. And Israel's going to enjoy that beauty one day when the Lord comes to rule and reign over them in the millennium and when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the seas. And they're going to enjoy that beauty and glory. They're going to then go into the eternal state and enjoy that heavenly new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. But we in the church, we already are enjoying that glory to an extent, aren't we? And we're already enjoying that beauty. And it's not just that we enjoy the beauty of the Lord Jesus, but as we gaze on his glory, 2 Corinthians 3 tells us that we are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. That the Lord is forming that glory in us and conforming us to the image of his son, as Romans 8 will say. And the same God who has redeemed us and justified us and reconciled us and sanctified us is going to present us in glory with himself, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful future we have, that as 1 John 3 says, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be with the Lord in glory. And so as bad as things may look around today, and as bad as things may even look in our own bodies, we say one day this is going to give way to glory. One day the Lord is going to transform us by his power. And he's able to do that because he came and died to take away sin. He dealt with that sin question at Calvary and he rose again and ascended on high, leading captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And so this Lord who has entered into glory is going to share that glory with us. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for thy word and the comfort it gives and the fact that saints in former generations and even in former dispensations, could speak about the Lord being their dwelling place. We think about that man living in a tent, living in the desert, and yet God was a firm dwelling place, a place of refuge for him. 
And Father, we live in houses or apartments, but we know this world's not stable. We know we can't build on this world, but we know the Lord is our dwelling place too. Teach us, Lord, to dwell more in the shadow of the Almighty, to come under thy wings for protection, and in everything to run to thee, to walk with thee closely, ever more closely, and enjoy the intimacy that we have with the living God. We pray it in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.